Have you ever sat and casted at a fish for what felt like hours? Just cast after cast after cast after cast after cast goes by, and the fish is just flat out ignoring anything and everything that you do. It starts to feel like the fish is trying to mess with you on purpose, kind of like when your buddies take the last Mountain Dew that they knew you were saving for dinner that night. It's really frustrating. Well, in today's episode, we're going to discuss a few key tactics that I think can help you avoid this really stressful situation and probably put some more fish in the net too. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. Excited, as always, to be here. Got some really fun stuff today. I'm actually coming to you from behind a brand spanking new microphone. Yeah, that's right. Brand new. We're going to improve the quality of the show. Hopefully improve your listening experience too while we're at it. And now my voice is going to come at you. My my dulcet tones are going to flow through your speaker with the grace of a cheetah. It's kind of scary to think about, isn't it? <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, we've got a fun show lined up. I'm really excited. And I hope everybody else is ready to come along for the ride with us. A few things before we jump right into things to start out today. First, our beginner fly fishing masterclass. It is live now. And I will not be sad if you quit listening to the podcast and go watch that right now. I, I would understand because, first off, it's amazing. All right. I've got a bunch of really great jokes. Uh, second, I mean, it's we answer so many questions in the beginning fly fishing masterclass. So it really is. It's a video series. I think Alex told me. We're looking at like 30 videos through the whole thing. So it's in depth of how to get started fly fishing. We really didn't leave any stone unturned with this. We tried our absolute best to cover everything that a beginner might need to know. And we're putting it into video form. The first two episodes are out now. I've got a link to them in the podcast description. So you can click on them, take a gander. Let us know what you think. I've been really stoked with the feedback so far. Uh, viewership's been great. People seem to really like what we're doing and we're just going to keep doing it. That's what we're doing here at VFC, right? We want to help everybody with the learning curve in fly fishing and help you up your skills as well. And we believe this is going to do that. Now, in conjunction with the beginning of fly fishing masterclass, we're doing a big time giveaway. If you listened last week, then you know what it is, but I'm going to give everybody a reminder because next week, that would be August 2nd. Let me make sure. Sometimes I'm not so great with my dates. Yes, August 2nd, we're going to announce the winner of this giveaway. And the winner receives a brand new starter pack from all of us here at VFC. The starter pack comes with everything you need to get started fly fishing. Rod, reel, line flies, a bag, all the accessories, everything you need to go out there and just jump in and get started fishing. It even comes with a net too. So this thing really is our all-encompassing starter pack. We're giving it away to one lucky winner. There's a few ways to earn some entries. There's actually four, four ways to earn some entries. You get one entry if you leave a comment on Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube that just says how long you've been fishing. That's all you got to do. Just leave that comment. That gets you one entry. You get two entries. If you subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple, you get five entries. Count them five. If you submit a question to the podcast, and then you get 10 entries. If you share this podcast episode on social media and tag us in the post. So those are the ways that you can enter and we're still taking entries like i said we're going to announce the winner on august 2nd so next week's show so make sure you enter and then tune in next week so you can find out who won and a couple more things and we're going to jump right into the show i promise first things first we need questions questions are what makes the show go around it's what keeps everything going please please submit your questions 
And I also want to give you a note to everybody who's submitted questions so far. First off, thank you. That's what allows me to do this show. And I love doing this show. It's so much fun. And I think everybody else is enjoying it too. So we definitely don't want this to go away at all, right? But please be patient as I get through all of the answers. I will answer yours, I promise. But I usually try to meld certain questions together and kind of stack them in a good order to give us a good show, to give us a nice flow of topics. So if I don't answer yours immediately, it will get answered. I promise. I've answered every question so far, and I'm going to answer them. Again, there's no question too small, so feel free to turn those on in. And last but not least, please, please, please rate and subscribe to this show wherever you're listening. Give us that five-star rating. If you're going to be that one person, I think there's literally one person who gave us like a two-star rating. Like, just don't rate the show <laughs> at that point. Or email us. If you think it's that bad, email us. Live your life at VenturesFlyCo.com. Email us. Talk to us. Let me know because I, I want to be a better podcaster. I want to help everybody out as best I can. So if it is two-star worthy, let us know. But give us a review. Subscribe wherever you're listening to this. It helps way more then you know. All right. I think all of our housekeeping items are accounted for. So that means we can jump right into the show. And this is a little segment that I introduced uh, two weeks ago, actually. And then Alex was on with us last week. And I wanted to see what everybody thought. So I asked for feedback. The feedback was really good. It's the story time with Spencer segment. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into that and then we'll get into your questions as soon as we're done with spencer's story time or story time with spencer i still haven't decided what we're gonna name that yet we'll just call it story time (laughs) all right story time is up next and then we'll get into your questions all right settle into story time with spencer crack open those diet cokes i think we are going to stick with story time with spencer i think that's a good one crack open those diet cokes and get ready for a little tale. A few years ago, and by a few, I mean probably six or seven at this point, I was out fishing with a buddy of mine. His his name's Blair. He is a fantastic individual, great fly fisher, definitely knows what he's doing, but he's just one of those good guys that you want like on your team all the time, right? He's just a good, good dude. And we were, we were out, we were here in Wyoming, actually, just before I moved here. We're here in Wyoming, and we were on a medium-sized river, but what really kind of, let me set the stage a little bit. It's like late July, perfect fishing weather. There's hoppers everywhere, and the water is perfect. There's no runoff. It wasn't high at all. It was perfect. Like I said, late July, so this is like the prime time to be out fishing. And we were on this river. We were set. We were so excited because everything was supposed to be perfect. And we knew this river was full of big cutthroat. So that's another big perk to going out there at this time. We figured we'd be catching so many fish that our arms would just fall off by the end of the day because they'd be so tired, right? And it always seems like whenever you go into <laughs> whenever you go into a, a trip like this with those super heightened expectations. Seems like it usually comes back to bite you in the butt a little bit. So something about that. Maybe there's a little life lesson in there too, in addition to a fishing lesson (laughs) for everybody. But we got up onto that river and we were, we were just blown away. It was the first time I'd ever fished there. I think Blair had fished it. Oh, I think he'd fished it a couple of times, but it was my first time. And the water just looked perfect. It was gorgeous. Just the most picture perfect runs, riffles, everything that you sort of expect to see in classic trout water is what we saw on that river. And we did not catch a fish. We drove up and down this thing. It's a long river too. So we drove up and down once we fished every good looking hole and we could not get a fish to come play for the life of us. It just seemed like it was an impossible situation that we found ourselves in. So we were really scratching our heads. We sat down for lunch and we're, we're looking at the river. A moose comes out 
classic Wyoming, right? A moose comes out and just stares at us and is like, why are you here? And we're like, well, we're, we're just trying to have lunch. Well, I am too, but this is my place. And the moose stomped off. And I looked at Blair. I was like, dude, what are we going to do? This river's kicked our butt. It shouldn't be this hard. It's all cutthroat, right? He's like, yeah. I said, well, what if we go into town? There's no, nobody can guide this river. So you, we couldn't just hire a guide or anything, but you, you can always go pick the locals' brains, right? So we, we went back into town, and we palled around for a little bit in, in this shop and ended up talking to the shop owner. And it, it was an outdoor shop, and he told us, he said, Are you guys trying to fish up there? We're like, yeah. He said, well, here. And he handed us a chubby Chernobyl hopper pattern, my favorite hopper pattern, said, this is all you need, but don't dead drift it. You just got to twitch it. And I looked at him like, what? He's like, yeah, twitch it. He's like, ain't you ever seen a hopper in the water before? And I said, honestly, no, I don't think so. He's like, well, it don't just lay there dead. It twitches. So you got to twitch your hopper or else the fish know it ain't real. And that kind of seemed odd to me. It was like, huh. Hmm. So I looked at Blair and he kind of shrugged at me too. We're both like, well, we ain't caught any fish already. So let's do it. So we took the hoppers from the guy. We went up the river again and we weren't very far. We were maybe 15 minutes from the shop. We weren't too far out of town. So it's on a stretch of water that gets hit pretty regularly. And <laughs> first cast, throw my fly up there. And I was like, all right. And I just jiggled the rod a little bit. I just twitch it. And what do you know, just like that cutthroat comes up and smacks it. And for the next couple of hours until it got dark, me and Blair twitched those hoppers like nobody's business and caught more fish and we knew what to do with. So, yeah, counterintuitive, right? But what the guy said at the store made a whole lot of sense. The fish wanted those hoppers twitching. They wanted them moving because it simulates the real thing. The hoppers don't just sit there and say, oh, well, I guess I'm in the water now. I'll just become fish food. No, they're going to try and get out of the water. So it makes sense, but it is tough to wrap your head around when you've been conditioned that it's got to be a dead drift. It has to be a dead drift or else you're never going to catch fish. So that was an interesting one for me personally. Just I, I wasn't expecting <laughs> anything like that. And then Another similar instance, you guys are getting a twofer today on story time, by the way. Me and Alex and his wife, we were here fishing in Wyoming last week, and we were filming for a little bit, and we were fishing this really big pool, beautiful, beautiful looking pool. And I fished this pool, I think like once before, and I hadn't caught anything out of it. It just, it's right by the road, so it gets fished a lot, and I wasn't really expecting much of it that day, but I threw the hopper out there. I had a hopper dropper rig on. I threw the hopper out there and I threw a couple of men's and I twitched it. And the first twitch, this brown trout just slams into that hopper, just hit it like it stole something from him. I couldn't believe it. Again, the twitch is coming right back to, to being a, a very valid uh, tactic. tactic. It's something that you're going to use, right? So the first instance a while ago, and then this one just barely with Alex, just kind of got me thinking again, you know, maybe it is worth twitching those streamers or <laughs> twitching those hoppers. You definitely want to twitch a streamer, twitching those hoppers a little bit more. I just think it's, it is a tactic that we probably don't take advantage of enough. And it does make sense because of course those hoppers are going to struggle a little bit. Now I'm not saying you know, surfboard this thing across the water, right? It doesn't need to look like a mini wakeboard or a jet ski going across the surface. That's ridiculous. But what I am saying is it's probably worth it to go ahead and, you know, twitch them a little bit, especially if you're casting right next to the bank. So that's your story time. Hopefully I'll take something out of that. And if you have any similar experiences, I'd love to hear about them. So definitely leave a comment or whatnot and let us know. But Enough story time, enough talking about myself. Let's jump into what everybody's here for, the questions. Andrew from Colorado writes in, first question of the show. Says, on last week's episode, you and Alex mentioned a bounce rig. What the heck is that? And when would you pull that one out of your arsenal? 
I'm guessing there are dozens, maybe hundreds of different rigs, but what are some of the more common ones we should keep in mind? <laughs> Andrew, uh, I died when, when you sent this question in because I'm sure folks who watched last week's episode and listened to it as well, excuse me, notice that there's probably some good natured ribbing going on between me and Alex about the bounce rig. Uh, so I just, I died when I saw this question it was perfect. And Alex is really excited to hear the answer to this question too. Uh, Oh, excuse me again. Sorry. You're certainly right that there are tons of different rigs and the bounce rig is just one of them. So I'm going to set the stage for you here a little bit. If you have ever fished for bass with conventional tackle, you might have used a drop shot rig. The bounce rig is essentially the exact same thing. We just call it something different in fly fishing. Now, the bounce rig that Alex and I are referring to is the Provo bounce rig, specifically developed on the Provo River in Utah, where we both grew up fishing. So it's got a little bit of cult status out there, and it's kind of a joke as well. It's like, oh, well, just tie on a bounce rig, you'll catch fish. And it really kind of has reached that status. And it is a very effective rig. I love to give Alex a hard time about it. Uh, but it, it is a really simple rig as well. So to set up the bounce rig, instead of tying your nymphs in tandem, when you would tie a nymph down and then you tie tip it off the bend of that hook to your next nymph, that's what we call tying them in tandem. You actually tie them off of tag ends. You tie a triple surgeon's knot and then you cut one of the tag ends, you know, six to eight inches short. You tie your fly onto the end of that and then your leader and tip it continues down this way you tie another one you've got another bug here and so they kind of drift like that uh but then at the bottom of that rig so you've got you've got your two tags and then at the bottom of the rig you've still got some line and that's where you actually crimp some split shot onto the tippet this creates a really heavy weight at the end of your rig this weight then sort of bounces along the bottom while the flies coming off those tag ends are free to drift naturally right there where you tied those surgeon's knots. It, if that sounds complicated, it really isn't that bad. I'm probably doing a terrible job of explaining it. You're, you're, imagine your leader is a straight line and then you tie a, a triple surgeon's knot so that you have a tag end pointing off that comes perpendicular. You tie your fly to that tag end, but then you come down, tie another triple surgeon. So you've got another tag end. You tie a fly to it, but then your leader is still continuing down below that second tag. That's where you put the weight so that it bounces. Again, if that doesn't make sense, I've included a link to some resources from the folks over at Fly Fish Food that shows you how to set this whole rig up. So hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense. Uh, as for when you want to use this, well, we'd really have to ask Alex about that since he loves the bounce rig so much <laughs> oh he's gonna he's gonna get mad at me for that one really kidding aside the bounce rig is great if you need to get nymphs down deep in really deep holes or in faster water alex will actually use the bounce rig a ton during a runoff and he will fish circles around me he's did it a bunch this year uh he it's a very effective rig and that's why alex uses it so that's your bounce rig. Hopefully I answered those questions. If there's any more, let me know. Now, as far as the most common rigs that you brought up, Andrew, uh, the dry dropper, your standard nymph rig, and a double dry. I mean, those three, th those are really simple, but that covers the vast majority of fly fishing situations right there. So those are the three that I would concern yourself with the most. Thanks a bunch for sending that question in, and uh, let's move on to the next one. Next question comes to us. Lad Gilman submitted this on YouTube, and you can submit questions there if you leave comments in the uh, in the comments section of the videos. We can probably get to them. Not a guarantee that those ones will be answered. The best guarantee is, as always, to submit them through the form, and there's always a link to that in the podcast description. So, anyways, Lad Gilman from YouTube, he writes in, it says, when fishing pressured tailwaters, what are some recommended ways to increase your chances to catch more fish? 
smaller flies, Euro rig, what else? Well, that's actually a really good question, lad. And I went ahead and referred to this in the hook for the episode. So hopefully it hooked y'all and, and brought you into, in, into the, sh- see, what, see what I did there? <laughs> but it's a good thing I cracked myself up, man, because uh, I don't know if I'm that funny. <laughs> Anyways, let's set the stage here. For folks who may not know, a tailwater is the river that's immediately below the dam. It, it comes out of the lake through the dam, creates a tailwater. It's usually crystal clear water, and the water temps are such that it's perfect for growing tons of bugs and therefore tons of big fish. But the other flip side of that is that tailwaters get absolutely hammered by people because if a fish are big, the hatches are usually wonderful and very well known. Uh, my favorite tailwater is the green in Utah. I've learned a ton over the years there. It's an excellent fishery, but it does get hammered by a lot of folks because the caddis hatches, the blue wing hatch, especially that a blue wing hatch on the green river is something to behold. It is just, it, it's like thick carpets of bugs floating down the river. It is just incredible when you, when you see it. it it's amazing. Uh, anyways. Drawing on that experience, I and looking around, getting a few more tips gathered up. There's three tips that I'd recommend that you use to help supercharge your success on tailwaters. And it's important to remember that you can use these tactics on any river. That's why the title of this podcast is the supercharger success on any river, because you can take these tailwater tactics and apply them anywhere you fish. They're most pertinent on a tailwater because fish on tailwaters are usually the most unforgiving. They're usually the most demanding of our skill set. But when you run into that odd picky fish uh, out on a freestone or in a spring creek, then these tactics can help as well. There's three of them, and I'll explain them in detail. But first, you want to make sure that you get a perfect or close to perfect drift. It doesn't have to be completely perfect, but the closer to perfect that you get, the better. Second, you want to make sure that you match the hatch. And third, you want to make that first cast count. So let's dive into each of those in detail. So first off, for the drift, remember these fish see tons, tons of flies. A lot of those flies are probably going to be drifted with less than perfect drifts. Now, we've talked a lot about presentation, about how it matters, and sometimes how you have to tweak the presentation from what you expect to what the fish actually expect. A good drift with a fly that's maybe not perfect, but a pretty close match, will catch fish a lot more often than a bad drift with the perfect fly. So you should be focusing on how you can put that right fly on the fish's dinner plate. Don't just get it into their kitchen. You want to cast that right onto their dinner plate. Don't make them work for it at all. Give it right to the fish. And if you can do that without any drag and without spooking the fish, then you're going to be in business. It might take some thinking. You might have to really engineer a solution for yourself there. But if you can accomplish that, you're going to start to realize that tailwaters and other high-pressured waters, it's not that they're all that tough as they are just demanding, if that makes sense. They can be hard to fish, and there are days when the fish just are off. I mean, that happens to everybody on every river, but you'll find that tailwaters aren't this like mystical, impossible to fish thing. They're just demanding. They they require excellent work on your part to be successful on them a lot of the times. Mo- Not every tailwater is as picky, but a vast majority of them certainly are. And just one more point about the drifts. I I just want to make this point here real quick. Uh, My, I got a good buddy of mine. His name is Mises Mike. And I haven't fished with him in a while. He he lives back in Utah and I haven't fished with him since I moved here to Wyoming. But we used to fish all the time together. And we were out during a blue wing hatch in Oregon fishing together. And this guy, I mean, he could catch fish out of a storm drain. The guy's just insane. But what blew me away about this hatch is I'm sitting there trying to match the blue wings perfectly. 
and I'm kind of getting my butt kicked. And Mike, I look upstream, and he's just fish after fish, just setting the hook into him. And so I look up at him. I said, Mike, what are you using? He's like, oh, I'm using a Griffith net. And he showed me his Griffith net, and the hackle was gone. That had been chewed off because he'd caught so many stinking fish. And he was just using basically just peacock curl on a hook. But his drifts were impeccable, and the fish were taking it. And this was on a tailwater during a blue-wing hatch when the water is really low and clear. So the fish should have been extra picky. Well, they just wanted something small, and Mike was delivering it to him with a perfect drift. So it worked for him. And I, I learned a lot from that instance because when you watch somebody fish circles around you with basically the simplest fly and you're sitting there trying to match everything perfectly and you still can't catch it, it really sinks in that, oh, hey, maybe I should work on that presentation of mine. So <laughs> it, was, it was definitely one of the big learning moments for me. All right, enough of that. We talked about presentation. Going on to the hatch. Now, you do need to match the hatch. Mike's example is kind of a little bit out there, the one that I just gave, but he was still matching size and shape with that Griffiths gnat. Maybe shape, not as much, but definitely size, which we know fish care about size more than anything else. So it is important to match the hatch. And by that, I mean it's important to make sure, take your time, and ensure that you are using the right fly for the stage of the hatch that you're in. When Mike was putting the herd on all those fish with that Griffiths gnat, they were actively eating duns, so they were eating the adult flies off the surface. They weren't trapped in the surface film, so that's probably another part of why the fish were hammering his fly so well, because it was the right size and they were eating off the top. So uh, that's what you want to make sure that you're doing, though, as when you're in these situations is you want to make sure you're matching that hatch. So if they're eating duns, have your dun on. If they're eating emergers or cripples or spinners, tie that on. Take a few minutes, watch what the fish are doing. That'll tell you what they're eating. Fish in tailwaters are rarely going to eat the fly that's the wrong stage of the hatch just because there's so many bugs that they're keyed in on the thousands of other natural bugs around them, and that's what they're going to eat. If they see something that doesn't belong, they'll just kind of ignore it and go to the stuff that, that does belong. So it's really critical to make sure that you have the right fly on. And we've actually developed a, or not developed, we wrote, I, I wrote, uh, with Alex's help, a brand new ebook about picking the right fly. This goes through everything you need to know, like how to identify if they're eating emergers or duns or whatever else it is. So. If that's an area where you need to improve, I've included a link to that ebook in the podcast description as well. So definitely take a look at that, and I'm sure it'll help you out. Now, as far as the last point, I'm going to quote the late William G. Tapley. He was one of the best fishing authors out there, and this was the last point where I said you need to make sure your first cast counts. He wrote about fooling smart trout, and he said, quote, Make your first cast count. Drifting the wrong imitation over a PhD trout will never spook him, but a sloppy cast or a dragging fly will. Make a practice cast. If you're fishing directly upstream, drop your fly just below the fish and watch how it drifts. Close quote. I can 100% vouch for this because I've put fish down way more times than I can count to bad casts where I see the fish rising. And I get really excited and I just start casting and my cast lands and it's like I throw a brick in the water and the fish just is like, oh, no, not today and scampers off. But I've also been on the flip side of that a few times where I've managed to get that first cast right. And it is magical when that happens. Give you an example. Last week, Alex and his wife were here and we were out fishing. We're doing some filming for the master class. And we were in the middle of this wonderful caddis hatch on this little river not too far from me. And the river's got some nice cutthroat in it, especially if you know know, where to go on this little river. And we were on this really interesting little run and kind of an eddy, really kind of weird water. But the drift, the window for the drift was super short. And we kept seeing this 
big cutthroat rise. And I, I mean, it was, it was big. I'm not sure how big I, if I had to guess, I'd say 17 to 18 inches, which I mean, that's not big, big, but for that stream, it is a monster. So I was, I was really excited and it was caddis hatch. So I'm like, Oh, I can fish this caddis hatch, right? Any, anybody can fish a caddis hatch. Well, I sat there and watched that fish for a few minutes, watched where he rose. And I looked at the water and I realized to get the cast in there, I was going to probably have to do a reach cast and then throw another mend immediately upstream so that I didn't get any drag. Because again, the window, just with the way the water was, the window for this drift was super short. It was maybe a couple feet and the water's moving pretty quick. So it's like two seconds that I had to get this drift in there and have it be perfect. And that first cast, because I'd sat there and I'd looked at the water, I'd watched the fish rise. That first cast, I threw it up in there, made the mend, it drifted down, and the fish hammered it, caught it. It was awesome. It was just wonderful. It, it worked out beautifully. That's because I made the first cast count. So it really does matter. But those are my three tips on how you can find more success, not only on pressured tailwaters, but if you apply these, uh, these examples to anywhere that you're fishing you're certainly going to find that you end up with more fish. So thanks a bunch for that question, lad. I really appreciate it. Man, just like usual, the show is flying by, but we've still got a couple questions to get us through to the end. So next question comes to us. Ben from Texas writes in, and he says, I have been fishing for the last few years, but didn't really start fly fishing until the beginning of 2023. It has been a lot of fun, and the content you all produce is very helpful in getting started. As a beginner and a new fly fisher, I am curious about what it was like when you started to fly fish. Did you catch fish often? What was the point in time when things started to click for you? What should a new angler expect on the water? It's always great learning about the types of gear and tips for fishing better, but I'd love to hear different stories of how people started fishing and what their experience was. I think it is helpful to keep it in mind someone's beginning shouldn't be compared to someone's middle or experience. Not that it is bad to share your wisdom or success now, but as a new angler, I think it's always fun to know where people started. Anyways, this might be a different type of question, but I hope it is helpful for someone else too. Thanks for all the content and all you do for the community. Ben, great question, and thank you for the kind words. Um, I actually have a cousin named Ben who currently lives in Austin. Uh, this ain't you, is it? <laughs> oh, well, I'm just going to take those questions in stride here. I really love it. Thank you. This is a great one. This one actually, this one really made me think in a different way than a lot of the other questions do. So I really, really like that. Well, how did it all start? For me, I got lucky because I grew up in a family where my dad fly fished and my grandpa fly fished as well. So I was going to fly fish whether I wanted to or not. Uh, thank goodness I fell in love with it. Uh, my dad started taking me out when I was like six. I remember one time he told my mom, he said, taking, I'm going to the store. I'm taking Spencer with me. We were supposed to do grocery shopping. And we got in the car and he started driving and he did not head towards the store. I said, Dad, you're not you're going the wrong way. He said, We're going fishing. We're not going to the store, but don't tell your mom. And I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited. We were playing hooky and mom had no clue. It doesn't get better than that when you're a kid. Oh, well, we got out and I I remember him catching. My dad caught fish after fish that night. And he he let one go in the water, it swam over my feet. And I, I still remember that to this day. It was such a cool moment for me that, that kind of cemented into me that I'm going to fish and I'm, I'm going to do it. Now, did that mean I got a PhD in it at a young age? Absolutely not. Because I thought I knew everything. I thought that my dad was an idiot by the time I started being old enough to really fly fish, right? A lot of us do. Uh, you know, in the teenage years, unfortunately. I don't think that now, by the way, Dad, in case you're listening, <laughs> you're certainly not an idiot, I promise. <laughs> I mean, you know, I had growing pains like everybody else. I was on the green one time, 
and the fish were rising. I don't even remember what to. All I remember is I was watching the fish rise. And I pulled a San Juan worm out of my box and thought, well, if they're rising, they'll probably want a worm, right? And I tied it on, and I couldn't understand why I didn't catch fish. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I have a butt kicked more, more times than I could even remember. So that's kind of how it started. Now, where did things start clicking for me? Well, I've talked bad on it on the show before, and it gets kind of a bad rap. But the Provo River in Utah, that's where things really started to click for me. It can actually be a pretty tough river to fish sometimes, but it started to click one summer. I was living with my grandma. This was after high school. I moved out. I was living with my grandma, and she lived like 25 minutes from the river. So I'd just go up there every night after work, and I started to regularly catch fish on the Provo. And the lessons that I learned there, I ended up applying to all the other rivers that I went to, and it all sort of snowballed for me from there. But that was probably that was probably a year, maybe a little over a year into me deciding to only fly fish. Now, I grew up fishing. I grew up doing both, though. I dunked worms. I really, for a lot of high school, I really got into fishing jigs and spin fishing with jigs. I loved it. And I still love to do that when the opportunity arises. I'll troll for salmon. I ice fish. I caught a big, uh, last winter, I caught a big lake trout through the ice, 40 inch lake trout through the ice. So I, I still do that kind of fishing, but not as much as I used to. So it was probably about a year when I, a year from when I decided I'm going to just fly fish and dedicate myself to that and figure it out. Probably a year from that moment is when things really started to click and I started to feel really confident out there on the water. I'm also a slow learner too. So I'm not saying that it's going to take everybody else a year, but Ben from Texas, he he asked this question. And uh, so I'm, you know, I'm just giving it to, giving it to y'all straight. So that's, that's what, uh, my experience was like when it started to click for me. Now, what should a new angler expect out on the water? That's easy. 25 inch fish. Duh. <laughs> oh, it's actually, I'm going to tell another couple of stories to, to get this. I've been married almost three years now. I know a lifetime, right? I'm practically, I should start doing a marriage podcast cause I'm such an expert on it. <laughs> oh, but it's been really interesting the last few years because my wife never fly fished until her and I met. So I've been teaching her. And if anybody's tried to teach her spouse or significant other to fly fish, it's probably gone about as well as it has for me where you get really frustrated and say things that you don't mean. And then you feel like an absolute jack wagon the rest of the time. And that's happened to me. And fortunately, my wife is the most patient, forgiving, wonderful lady on the face of this planet. So she hasn't held that bad behavior against me, uh, even though I've been not the best teacher. But she's been really kind of frustrated lately, not lately, lately, but about a year ago, she was kind of to the frustrated point with it because she was still struggling with the casting and struggling with reading water. And so it was tough for her, but we actually went out on Sunday right after church and got into some fish and took her out and she caught them all. I mean, I, I said cast there and then I just kind of stood to the side and she did all the work. The, the casts were on point. She set the hook fine. She got them in and did it all on her own. And that, switch kind of flipped for her right then I think and since I've mellowed (laughs) I've become less of a jerk and now that she's actually catching fish she's just enjoying the heck out of it so what I would take from that is I would say to expect a steep learning curve but enjoy the process because I know that's kind of what my wife went through and I think that's what a lot of us go through too is it's a steep learning curve but enjoy the process because it's fun And what else are you going to do, right? If if you hate the process, then why are you fishing? Go do something else. So that's what I'd say to to your question there, Ben. Thank you a ton 
for that question. Like I said, it really kind of pushed me to think in different ways uh, than I do on a lot of the other questions. So thanks a bunch. Well, you know what, folks? That's actually going to do it for us for this episode of Untangled. Super glad that everybody listened on to the end here, that you've enjoyed the show. Really appreciate it. Appreciate everybody who's been part of this community and continues to join the community each and every day. We are having a ton of fun here at VFC, uh, just getting this started and going with it. So, uh, reminder, we do have the brand new Beginner Fly Fishing Masterclass out I'll leave a link to that in the description. If you have any questions for the show, please do not hesitate to send those on in and they will all get answered. Remember that from the beginning of the show. I will answer the questions. It just might take a minute, but they will get answered. And then last but not least, please make sure to rate and subscribe to the show anywhere that you might be listening. And don't forget... A week from now, we're going to announce the winner of the Starter Pack giveaway. So you definitely do not want to miss next week's episode. And with all that, hope you guys are having a wonderful time out on the water this summer. And until next week, tight lines, everybody. <laughs>